Praise the Lord, saints. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another Sunday School morning lesson. We are still in the book of Revelation, which is a very interesting book. It's filled with all kinds of goodies. and I'm just curious to know uh, who reads a book and don't read how the book ends. I mean, the book is just useless if you don't read the end of it. And that's what we'll be studying today is the end times, the book of Revelation, uh, which God uh, wrote to the Apostle John. Amen. And it is a great book. Uh, we'll get right into the lesson because we're going to run into a time problem if we don't. Let us uh, begin with, open up with prayer. Almighty God, we pray, Lord God, that you, your anointing would fall fresh. Lord God, that you will speak to me, Lord God, so that I may speak to your people. Lord, I pray for clarity. And you said in your word, in all of your getting, get understanding. I pray that we have an understanding, Lord God, of what you're saying in the book of Revelation today. Make it plain, make it clear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Our lesson this morning will be coming from, as I said, the book of Revelation, chapter 11. The printed text is verses 15 through 19. It says here in the Unifying Principle, celebrations are a way of culminating a unique event and creating new ways of being in community. How do people celebrate in a hostile world? Revelation helps us understand that all of the world is moving toward the just, eternal reign of God. It's all coming to an end. One day God will be in, in control. He's already in control, but he'll be in control of everything, heaven, earth, and the enemy will be defeated. The aim for change states by the end of this lesson, we will define the nature of God's reign for eternity. And we will reflect on how God's eternal reign affects our faith. And engage in activities that reflect the sovereignty of God in healthy powerful, transforming ways. The background, if I might uh, give a little bit of a background, it, uh, the commentator writes, while many traditions have encouraged a reaction of fear of this book, its actual purpose is not to elicit fear, but rather to incite an unadulterated, unhindered worship to Almighty God. The book of Revelation largely tells the drama or the completion of God's plan played out in three separate acts. Act one features seals being opened. Act, act two features trumpets heralding the arrival of God's eternal kingdom. Act, act three features bowls of judgment on those who reject God. Each act contains songs celebrating the, the action. Revelation 11 describes the action ending in Act 2, the blowing of the seventh trumpet. The commentator also writes that uh, the key to understanding Revelation lies in recognizing the type of literature it is known as apocalyptic. Apocalyptic, the definition of apocalyptic means the ending of time or the destruction of this world and the entering in of a new era. Apocalyptic literature features unveiling of a big picture reality by a heavenly being, God or angels, to a human recipient, that's us. The reality that is revealed includes elements of both time, dealing with end time and judgment, space, the reality of another supernatural world. The central part of Revelation concerns three sets of seven events initiated in heaven. The opening of the seals in Revelation 6, 1 through 17 through 8, 1 and 5. The sounding of the trumpets, Revelation 8, 6 through 9. And the pouring out of bowls of judgments, Revelation 16, 1 through 21. The results on earth are cataclysmic. Each of these events end with a time of worship and adoration. Today's lesson, 
deal with the climax of the, the second of these three sets of events. The immediate context for today's passage is that of seven angels who are ready to sound seven trumpets. So that was found in Revelation 86. The results of, of the first four of the seven sounding finds parallel with the ten plagues poured out in Egypt. The first uh, trumpet signals a bloody fiery hailstorm that destroys one third of the earth. That was Revelation 8 and 7. The second trumpet leads to something like the appearing of a burning mountain being hurled into the sea. The sea turns to blood, sea creatures are killed, ships are destroyed. Revelation 8, 8 and 9. The third calls for a fiery start from the heavens that pollute many of the fresh freshwater rivers and brings death. Revelation 8, 10 through 8. The four strikes part of each of the light, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Revelation 8 and 12. The fifth trumpet signals the opening of the abyss, unleashing a horde of locals on humankind in the process. Revelation 9, 1 through 5. The sixth releases four mighty angels and their armies to kill one third of sinful humanity. These judgments, however intense, fail to stop the adultery and sexual immorality of the world. Which brings us to, amen, our lesson today. Let's, let us read, beginning at verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that thou shouldest be judged, and that thou shouldest give Reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in the heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. That is the reading uh, of our text today. A very short text, but it's a lot in, in in that text. I want to read to you for a foundation before we get into our lesson, something out of the book of Revelation. And uh, this is a teaching moment. Uh, it's a lot to be learned from the book of Revelation. I'm in the book. Beginning at verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, I'm going to begin at verse 3 of chapter 11. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devoured their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in like manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, shut heaven that it rain not in the day of their prophecy and have power over water to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they sh shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindred and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them, they told the truth, that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from, from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. 
And they heard a voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies behold them. And the same hour there was an earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake and, and, uh, and in the earthquake was slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second war is passed. Behold, the third war cometh quickly. This is all right before, which brings us to our text today. And I want to talk just a little bit before I begin in about our lesson about these two witnesses. He said he would give power to two witnesses. The question is, who are these two witnesses? It has been thought by uh, theologians that these two witnesses will be uh, Elijah and Moses. They have a lot of similarities. One of them will have power to shut up heaven that it will rain not in the day of their prophecy. And the other one will have power to turn the waters into blood and will smite the earth with all kinds of plagues. That's Moses. So we have uh, two witnesses. And they will be killed by uh, the beast and they're going to, it's going to be three and a half years, which is half of a seven year, uh, which means uh, uh, perfection. Uh, that'll be three and a half years. This is going to take place. And they're going to prophesy. They're going to come and prophesy. They're going to rise from the dead and prophesy about God. And they're going to kill them. And they're going to lay it dead for three and a half days. And then God will speak his voice into them and speak life into them. And they will come alive. Which brings us to our lesson today. Apocalyptic literature. It's the first verse says, The seven angels sounded his trumpet. Various forms of the number seven occur hundreds of times in the Bible. Its occurrences often signal completeness. Trumpets are blown at ascensions of kings to their throne. It's a celebratory event when kings, uh, like we, uh, we elect a president. Well, this is similar, but this is when a king is ascending to their throne, they blow trumpets to announce his arrival. Amen. And it says it, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever, forever and ever. Following or perhaps accompanying the sound of the trumpets, unidentified heavenly voices make the grand pronouncement. Loudness in this book characterizes worship. You don't whisper worship. Should not God's victory be declared as loudly as possible? Old Testament prophets look forward to the day when the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It will, it will itself endure forever. You can find that in that book of Daniel, uh, chapter 2, verse 44. In John's vision, the day when the Lord would be king over the whole earth, that can also be found in Zechariah 14 and 19. The sin that separated the human realm from the heavenly realm will no longer be an obstacle. John later pictured this kingdom as the unified city of New Jerusalem. Those who continue to sin are not allowed to enter into the city. Amen. It will be a day of celebration. Amen. When God will reign. Amen. When the devil will be defeated and God will reign. Amen. It will be a great celebration going on. Amen. Uh, one that the prophets of old have looked forward to, that have prophesied about. Uh, all those prophets in the Old Testament, they prophesied of this in the book of Daniel, in the book of Ezekiel, uh, in the book of uh, Zechariah. Uh, they prophesied that uh, one day God will do away with all sin and will reign in this earth. And uh, that's what they're celebrating in here in the book of Revelations, chapter 11, verse 15 will say where God will reign forever and ever. Voices proclaim that God will reign forever and ever, whereas the kingdom of this world, now we're talking about the kingdom of this world, is temporary. It's filled with sin, but the reign of God will be eternal, featuring everlasting life for the faithful. 
Amen. We're living in that holy city, in that kingdom. I want to be in that number. How about you? I want to be in that number, a number that no man could count. Amen. Uh, in, that, in that holy city where the streets are paved with gold. Amen. Where every day is howdy howdy and no more goodbyes. Uh, it says here that God's eternal reign is shared with the Lord's Messiah. It's, it, God is sharing this with his, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Uh, God's eternal reign is shared with the Lord's son, Messiah, his Christ. These are Hebrew and Greek words that mean the same thing, uh, Messiah and Christ. They mean the same thing, the anointed one. As the heavenly choir praises the one who sits on the throne, so do the heavenly voices here in the text. And the 24 elders who were seated on their throne before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. I want to talk a little bit about, just like, like I said, this is a little bit of a learning uh, Sunday school lesson. The 24 elders. Who are the 24 elders? Who are they? Uh, it's thought by theologians that the 24 elders are leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. Those are 12. And the other 12 are the 12 uh, 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 disciples of Jesus Christ, which make up the Old Testament and the New Testament, which makes 24 elders. Amen. Uh, as the elders fell on their faces. If you notice in Revelation 4 and 10 and Revelation 5 and 8, the uh, 24 elders fell down and worshiped. Uh, they fell down and worship. Here, they did more than just fall down and worship. They were complete prostrate before God. They fell down on their faces, amen, showing humility and submission, amen. It was just more than uh, a bowing down, but they fell down on their faces and they worshiped. They worshiped. They worshiped. Amen. They weren't worried about getting their suit dirty or getting their clothes dirty. Amen. They fell down on their faces. They weren't worried about their hair or their makeup, but they fell down on their faces and they worshiped. They worshiped. Uh, it says that they were seated on the throne. They were seated on the thrones before God. But when it was announced of God's uh, uh, reign, they fell on their faces. And the Bible says, and they worshiped God. God is worthy of our worship. Amen. Uh, it says, saying, we give thanks to you, Lord, God Almighty. In their dramatic posture of worship and submission, the elders begin their thanks by addressing God in a certain way. Hear me now. Using the respectful, reverential title, Lord God Almighty. The word translated Lord in and of itself implies only a measure of respect as saying something similar like sir. When combined with God Almighty, the full three-word use of this designation is found only in the New Testament, only in Revelations 4 and 8, 11 and 17, 15 and 3, 16 and 7, 19 and 6. It served to relay the expansive power of God in the world. He's God over everything, over everywhere, over every place, over everybody. He's God over everything. He's, he's, his power is expansive. Amen. There's nothing that he is not uh, has power that he doesn't have power over. He has power over everything, over heaven, over earth, over everything in, in sea, in under the earth. He has power. His power is expansive. John's use of this title reflects his confidence that God's redemptive plan would come to fruition even in the midst of tribulation and suffering. Nothing is going to stop God's plan from coming to fruition. Absolutely nothing. Nobody. Uh, uh, if God said it, it shall come to pass. Amen. The 24 elders also said the one who was, the, the one who is and was. The elder described God's eternal nature. This same description is used by the author himself, the Apostle John in Revelation 1 and 4. It is also used by the Lord God in 1 and 8 and by the four living creatures in Revelations 4 through 8. 
This, ref this description reflects and expands on God's self-designation, I am that I am, of Exodus 3 and 14. As this description speaks of God's eternal, unchangeable nature, it implies his sovereignty. God is immutable. Uh, he does not change. Uh, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, God, he never changes. And it implies his sovereignty. Uh, God is sovereign. He does what he wants to do, when he wants to do it. And how he wants to do it, he has. He doesn't have to counsel. No, no one counsels him. He doesn't take counsel from anyone. Uh, he's sovereign. These twenty-four elders also said, "Because you have taken your great power and have began to reign." This part of John's prophetic vision will be the final move of God as He establishes a new heaven and a new earth. As God establishes a new heaven and a new earth, amen, they're celebrate, celebrating because God have taken his great power and have begun to reign, amen. They're seeing uh, it's a new day, a new shaft is in town. The elders recognize and acknowledge God's right to rule and stand supreme over all the earth. Uh... That means that uh, God said that this day was coming. And these elders recognize and acknowledge that God has the right. After all, God is the creator of heaven and earth and everything therein. Uh, the sheep on a thousand hills belong to him. We are the sheep of his pasture. Amen. And everything, everything, the gold is here, the silver is here, everything is here. Cattle on a thousand hills, it's all here. And if God decides, uh, I'm going to destroy this kingdom and, 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 and build a new kingdom, an everlasting kingdom, one that will never be destroyed, God is sovereign. He has the power to do that. Uh, okay. Let's see. Okay. Uh, the nations were angry. And your wrath has come. The elders now describe reaction to God's exercise of his power. Nations, now their anger is a result of having to face God's wrath. His wrath poured out on them does not result in repentance, just the opposite. I want to read from this book. While the nations feel wrathful, only God has the power and the authority to act on his justified wrath. Wrath. The wicked are about to get their just due from God. It's been a long time coming, but they are finally about to be judged by God. P the commentator writes, people sometimes become angry when others are being rewarded, and they are not. But God does not play favors. Uh... The God is God is dispensing fair wages of work done, whether good or bad. God does not play favorite. He ensures that small and great alike have their equal time before the judge. He sees that those destroy and enact the same destruction on them. I'm getting a little better ahead of myself. But it says that uh, the time has come for judging the dead. The time of judging the dead is when all who have lived and died throughout history will be resurrected, resurrected to face judgment and for rewarding your servants, the prophets. One of two categories will be rewarded is God's servants, the prophets. This can include those servants who God spoke, those servants of God who spoke about the future as well as those servants who preach the message of God. Amen. Those who preach and those who spoke about the future. Uh, prophets can be both foretellers and forth tellers. In both cases, the one proclaiming God's truth called people to a faithful relationship with God. The heart of this relationship is forsaking all other gods in remaining loyal to him alone. 
And he goes on to say, and reward your servants, the prophets, and your people who rever, revere your name, both great and small. The second group to be rewarded are the people of God who revere God's name. They, like the prophets, were faithful, some even to the point of death, even to the point of martyrdom in the service of the Lord. Amen. Uh, some even to the point of martyrdom who died in the service of the Lord. Uh, both great and small are in view. And he's speaking of uh, on different levels of rewards, uh, both small and great. God is inclusive of every one of his servants. Amen. He doesn't miss anyone. You don't have to be uh, a prophet, a uh, preacher, uh, someone with a title. Uh, he's not into titles. Uh, he rewards all of his uh, servants, all of the saints, all of the people of God. He rewards them all. And it says, and for destroying those who destroy the earth, the elders in their utterances by returning to the imagery of the angry mob, defeated and punished. And this is what I like. God is going to destroy those who have done a lot of destroying. Amen. Uh, for those, for, for destroying those who destroy the earth. He's not talking about who litter the earth. Uh, uh, but he's talking about those who have done damage. Amen. To... Uh, his church and to his people. Amen. Uh, th those who have did the destroying, God is going to destroy them for their destroying. And he ends by saying the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in this temple the ark of the covenant, the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings, an earthquake and great hail. Amen. The opening of the temple is accompanied by severe phenomena as the breaking of the seven seals. There is lightning, thunder, and an earthquake. Such imagery reminds us of what happened when Moses uh, led the people before Mount Sinai. There was lightning, thunder, and an earthquake, and they were, they were so afraid. They asked Moses, you speak to us. Please don't let God speak to us anymore. He's scaring us to death. Such imagery, imagery is characteristic of apocalyptic literature. It's intended to catch the reader's attention, perhaps to show the seriousness of God's judgment. Indeed, a severe hailstorm is often associated with such judgment. Additionally, such imagery would draw the attention, the, the, the audience, to compare John's revelation with God's dramatic revelation to Moses. The God who revealed himself with, to Moses will someday reveal himself to all people as the judge and the one worthy of worship. Uh, that concludes our lesson for today. Amen. Uh, thanks be to God for the Lamb of God. Uh, God is going to show up and show out at the end of days. And uh, But you have no need to be concerned. You have no need to worry because the church will be raptured out of here before all of this uh, takes place. Amen. We'll be uh, uh, gone home to be with the Lord. Amen. Because we'll be raptured out of here. I hope you have learned something today. I did my best. And I hope my best was good enough. Our lesson next week will, st will still be in the book of Revelation. It's a deep book. It's a deep book. And I don't have the time to get as deep as I would like to get, but uh, I'll do the best I can. Now, next week's lesson is called The Marriage of the Lamb. All right, The Marriage of the Lamb. Amen. That will be taken out of uh, Revelation 19, chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. Uh, I encourage you to read the lesson uh, so you can get, in all you're getting, get understanding, so you can get understanding. Uh, like I have enjoyed this lesson. And I hope you have uh, enjoyed it as well. Uh, let us end with prayer. Almighty God, we thank you, Lord God, for your celebratory ending, Lord God, how you end. Lord God, you, you're worthy of all our praise, all of our worship, Lord God. And from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, you're worthy. Lord God, we just thank you, Lord God, for how you have watched over us and kept us. We thank you, Lord God, for revealing to us your plans. Lord God, thank you, Lord God, for just being God. Lord God, I pray that you would bless the sick and the shut-in, 
And all those who have viewed this lesson, Lord God, I pray that you would bless them for viewing it. Lord God, to continue to have your way with your people. And we'll be careful to give your mighty name all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. Now may, now may the grace of God, the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us all, now, henceforth, and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.